Hello everyone and um, thanks for coming. When Joe Mooney first approached me back in February this year with an idea to hold the Sarah Lundberg Summer School in honour of my brother Philip, I was touched that in the 10th anniversary year of his death, his words and music still resonated enough for people to want to discuss his work and to research the influences which formed the basis of his lifelong dedication to the arts. What also struck me was that the nature of this summer school is one which would have greatly appealed to Phil. Its dedication to creativity and also to inclusivity forms the nucleus, nucleus of his foremost raison d'etre. Joe Mooney himself is a lifelong community activist, a member of the East Wall History Group and coordinator of the annual Sean O'Casey Festival. I feel sure that Philip would have admired Joe's active role within his community and also the quiet grace with which he goes about that work. I have to say that Joe has never attempted to own this project which culminates here today, but he simply launched the idea and let all the individual participants create the event. It has been a very enriching and enlightening experience to work alongside Joe as he coordinated the birth of this wonderful celebration. Thank you so much, Joe. Without you, this wouldn't be happening today. I suppose in order to fully understand where a writer or a musician found their influences, you would probably have to start right at the beginning and go back to their childhood to form a full picture of the artist. And that is where I come in. I'm the person who can tell you about the young Philip Chevron and what moulded the person he became. And that is why Joe asked me to start off this day by giving you just a brief portrait of the artist as a young child. The thing is, I can actually tell you the precise moment when Phil's love of the arts started. This moment has been celebrated and talked about in our family down through the years. It is a tale which goes a long way towards explaining a life lived with such singular intent. It began one December evening back in 1959, when Phil and was two and a half years old. He was brought to the Gaiety Theatre for his first Christmas pantomime. My mum and dad sat in the stalls of that theatre, with Philip safely tucked in between the two of them, not knowing the influence this day would have on the life of their young son. As the safety curtain was lifted in the theatre to reveal the plush red velvet curtains behind it on the stage, Phil's attention became totally focused and his eyes never left that stage until the final curtain was made. And as a by the way, it's a matter of interest to note that later in life, when Phil had bought his own house in Nottingham, he had red velvet curtains specially made for his windows, which exactly mimicked stage curtains. They pooled slightly on the ground like an old fashioned theatre curtain and he had a deep red pelmet fringed with tassels at the top. He utterly lived for the stage in all respects. Getting back to that night in 1959, he watched the pantomime with rapt attention. And when the show was over and it was time to go home, he refused to leave his seat. My parents both tried in vain to get him to leave, but he was holding firm and going nowhere. Bribes were offered to him, but ultimately they failed, as in Philip's young mind, nothing was better than what he had just experienced. When the auditorium was completely empty, the usherette then came over. She would have been dressed in the front of staff house uniform of the theatre. And so Phil was willing to listen to her as she was clearly part of the show. In his young eyes, she had authority. She knelt down to his level and promised him that if he went home now, he could return to the theatre later for another performance. Well, this seemed like a reasonable plan to Phil, and so he was persuaded to vacate his theatre seat. 
what I can tell you now is that although he did leave the theatre that day, he left his young heart behind him and spent the following 54 years until his death, returning thousands of times to reconnect with whatever it was that touched the absolute quintessence of his being on that December evening long ago. When he died, I had the task of clearing out all his papers and his house. I found a box full of theatre tickets with bookings every month for the following two years after his death. He had planned his theatre going for years ahead. There were tickets for performances all around the world, including New York, Los Angeles, London, his beloved Stratford, the Opera House in Sydney, and of course, Dublin. And there were also tickets there amongst the others for the forthcoming Wexford Opera Festival, which commenced two weeks after his death. These were for sellout performances for works by the likes of Verdi and Balf and Nino Rota. But there was a singular, single unoccupied seat in each of those performances. And to all intents and purposes, it had been forgotten by the ticket holder. But those seats were very much filled with the spirit of a dedicated and passionate theatre lover whose only reason for not attending was that he had taken his own final curtain. Also amongst his papers, I found dozens of boxes filled with theatre programmes of shows he had seen. And I'm not joking when I say there were several thousand programmes and playbills there. Stapled carefully to each of those programmes was the ticket for the performance. And I discovered through that that he had a particular penchant for a seat about six rows back and six seats in from stage right. He never, never varied from that. He had also marked on each programme a score for the performance based on a five star scoring system. As far as I could see, only a handful were given a five star score out of the thousands. There were brief explanations of his thoughts on each show, so I began to get a very surface view of what appealed to him. And, you know, it's only now and in hindsight, I wish I had kept all of that archive. Maybe it would have given some idea as to what went on in the mind of someone who absolutely lived for the arts and for creativity. But ultimately, I don't think anyone could ever claim to know the complex mind, which was Philip Chevron. Theatre was his first love, and this would later influence the lyrics and the style of his songs and performances. He inherited that love from our father, who was deeply involved in the theatre as a young man through acting, directing and writing. He gave all of this up in order to provide for his young family. But later in life, he went on to write several books about the theatre, including biographies of Jimmy O'Dea and the great Noel Purcell. And then his last book was called The Lost Theatres of Dublin, which has attained a kind of a cult status amongst aficionados of the theatre. As children, we were regular theatre goers. Nothing was ever considered too difficult for our young minds. And so we absorbed the works of the likes of Yeats, Beckett, Singh, Busiku, Bean, Shaw, and all the other boys in the literary band, and including the man for whom this wonderful theatre is named, Sean O'Casey. The bookshelves at home were filled with books of classic and contemporary literature, none of which were marked out of bounds for us. Music was constantly on the turntable of our old record player, an eclectic mix of anything from Gilbert and Sullivan operettas to Verdi and Puccini, plus a lot of contemporary and music hall songs. And so it was that under this rich cultural persuasion, Philip absorbed the various influences which formed the basis for his own creativity and love of the arts. When it came to his own choices in music, Phil had a very wide and extremely eclectic taste. It stretched from all the music I just mentioned just now, plus the complete back catalogue of the Eurovision Song Contest in the 60s and 70s. He loved Irish traditional music and the Horse Lips era is a particular notable one. And then there was musical theatre. 
This was a particular love of his, probably his best love in music. And I was brought on board for this one in order to sing the parts of each female lead in those shows. We staged so many musicals over the years for the delights of our long suffering friends and family. And this love of musical theatre resulted in him later working on various theatre productions as a musical consultant. His first would have been a production of Lysistrata by Aristophanes, which was directed by Agnes Burnell in the Project Arts Centre here in Dublin. He went on to work with Jim Sheridan in his show, The Hapney Place. He also worked with the wonderful Cathy Burke, who directed Brendan Behan's The Queer Fella for the Oxford Stage Company. Another one I can remember he worked on was the London production of Druid Theatre's The Playboy of the Western World, directed by Gary Hines. There are many, many more which I don't remember, unfortunately, but they're there. Then there was the unfinished musical project, which Phil was working on with Irish writer Declan Lynch, who will be speaking here later today. As someone who knew Philip probably as well as he ever could be known, I feel sure that this is the music, that this musical is the project which he would have cherished the most in his life. Luckily, some of the music which he wrote for it has been recorded by the likes of the late Ronnie Drew and Kirsty McCall. And Pete Holiday, who is here today also, is working on refining these recordings with a view to possibly releasing them publicly in the near future. Let's hope that project comes to fruition. When we were growing up together, I think Phil saw me mostly as a useful female lead singer soprano to take part in his many projects. Initially, I was far too easily brought on board by his powers of persuasion and sometimes perhaps a little bribery. This bribery usually took the form of a few worn down coloured pencils, comic books and notebooks or some other mundane pre-loved trinket. This was the price he paid for my attendance at hours of rehearsals and performances. For the various iterations of bands he formed in our very early teens, I trudged along to multiple venues and sang the songs, sang the songs assigned to me and perhaps gave a little desultory tap on a rusting tambourine. But by the age of around 15, I'd had enough of the stage. We were so very, very different in character. The stage was Philip's life, whereas I had absolutely no interest in performing. He did his best to persuade me otherwise, but as much as he was completely confident in performing and his, cre his performing and creative abilities, I was also confident that I was not in possession of a notable talent. I also didn't have a hunger for the buzz of a life on the stage like he did. I was a much more pedestrian character and never wanted to chase the public gaze. And yet, here I am in front of you all today, yet again at the behest of my faithful departed brother. Even from the grave, he is getting his worth from those old pencils and comics from long ago. <laughs> and so it went that our lives took very different routes. But those roads would intersect at various stages throughout life, when we would then fall seamlessly back into step with each other in an instinctive and unspoken connection which formed an unshakable bond and trust between us, no matter what the circumstances. One of the last things Phil said to me before he died was that I knew how to listen to him like no one else could. And what he was also saying was that I had an intuition for what he needed. A childhood spent together showed me a very private side to him which very few others were privileged to know, and we knew the measure of each other. When I think of Phil now, I immediately see that cheeky grin, with his head turned slightly to one side, his eyes fixed firmly on the speaker, so that he could hear what was being said. Not a lot of people know that he was actually completely deaf in one ear, and so he had developed that turn of the head, which became a familiar characteristic of his persona. Also, when I think of him, I see the smart shoes, always wore bright coloured socks. I see the ubiquitous hat topping off some dapper outfit he wore. 
But when I think of him mostly, I see the little boy who was my soulmate when we were small children growing up together. And I remember with fondness the times at night when we should have been asleep, we had crept out of bed and pulled back the curtains in order to look out at the long back gardens back which bordered the houses on our road. There we watched the jigsaw of windows lit up in the houses against the dark night and we would invent stories together about people who might live in those houses or the magical fairy people who might live secretly in the garden. These stories flowed between us, taking turns to carry the task of imagination. And at times we would add a song which might fit the scene and it was usually a Julie Andrews song. This would entertain us for ages and my only thought now is how we were never caught by my parents for being out of bed. But thinking about it, they probably well knew, but chose to leave us to our imaginations and that private world which only siblings inhabit. We enjoyed weaving those stories, but the difference, difference between the two of us and our ability to create is that Phil never stopped visiting that world of imagination whereas I got off that train somewhere between the stations of conformity and the road most taken. As we got older, we could never again regain those clandestine storytelling story nights, but they were the basis of an unshakable trust, which was never broken. When he died, Philip wasn't even close to being done living. He was very angry that the time he thought he had left was being stolen from him. There were so many more songs to be written, so many books to read, so many subjects to research, and so many shows to be seen. But above all, he wasn't finished writing. He thought he had time to write the books which were waiting patiently to be written. They were in his plan, but he ran out of time. Above all else, Philip was a very enigmatic character. He was known in part by a lot of people, but wasn't fully known by anyone. He compartmentalized his life so that each aspect was kept separate, separate. Only he held all the cards. I hope that by coming here today, maybe we can all see a fuller picture of Philip Chevron as told by the people who occupied the various areas of his life. Finally, as we are lucky enough to be in this wonderful space today, named for one of Ireland's greatest creative minds and formidable activists, Sean O'Casey, I thought I would finish with a quote from that great man, which for me epitomizes the beautiful mind, heart and life of my brother Phil. It comes from a book called The Sting and the Twinkle, Conversations with Sean O'Casey, and it goes like this. I have found life an enjoyable, enchanting, active, and sometimes terrifying experience. And I've enjoyed it completely. A lament in one ear, maybe, but always a song in the other. Thank you all. <laughs>